I'm Dr. Caitlin Kite from the Academic Development Team, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about developing your research communication skills. So why do we even care about this? Well, research communication, uh, also called outreach or impact activities, this is something that's becoming more and more of interest uh, to funding bodies, to researchers who are engaged with these sorts of activities, to people that want to consume these activities from the other side of things. So it's all about uh, engaging a wider audience to provide information about research that's being done. It's about building and maintaining a network, so that network might involve a variety of stakeholders, including the public, collaborators, funding bodies, um, industry, and so on. It's about publicizing your work so that people are aware of new developments. It can involve information management so that you can collect information or share information as a resource. And it can also just be really fun. So most research outreach that people do involves more than one of these things. They can work together and support each other. You can have activities that achieve all of these goals at once. But this is a really good list to get you started. It's actually something that has come out of some research done by a sociologist named Mark Kerrigan, who looked at how uh, academics tend to use social media and to do sorts of, of outreach sorts of activities. And these are the categories that you might find yourself mulling over as you think, do I want to do some work and, and what does that work look like? So let's say that you have done that bit of contemplation, you've decided that you want to produce something and share it with the world. How can you decide what you want that to look like? What sort of good research communication do you want to be aspiring to? Well, I have here a few examples of research communication that I think is particularly effective and impactful, and it's really fun as a consumer to look at these things and to engage with them. Now, I'm not going to speak at length about each of these, but there are clips and there are links and there are supporting materials with more information on all of these so that you can go look in more detail at each of them and see if they actually do the sort of thing you want to achieve. So the first example, Journecology, is uh, by a photographer and videographer who creates a lot of visual resources that he puts together so that people can basically visit places from the comfort of their own homes. And that is something to get people excited about ecology and conservation, but also to make the world more accessible to people that actually can't go out. So you can see that while you're educating people, you can also um, engage in a bit of social justice there and, and open up the world and be more equitable. So you can have multiple things going on, as I said, with one project. Some other examples are a bit more arty. So you've got the hyperbolic crochet coral reef, which is a project that involved um, initially a small group of people and has become global. So you've got volunteers and artists and craftspeople around the world collaborating on creating crochet versions of coral reef uh, organisms in order to create these elaborate um, constructs so that people can go in and think about how much variety there is in a coral reef, what it looks like, how intricate they are, and how they are vanishing. So it has a very powerful conservation message as well. And whole communities come together around creating these things, which has a really interesting knock-on effect outside of the communication and education aspects of things. Another example is Gold Dust by an artist who has created this series of um, images, this visual art, to just give you a sense of what it's like to see movement and what happens when air moves and when things move in air. And it's the sort of thing that you might not really think about, but it gives you this sense of thinking about concept, movement, from a whole new point of view, and then applying that to other aspects of your life, whether they're artistic or scientific. Damn or Not is a really fun internet game created by a, a scientist who studies, as you might expect, dams and other water systems. And Twitter games are increasingly popular now where people will put up a photograph or ask a question, put up a survey, and get people to engage with it. So it's not just something that you can passively look at as an audience, but it's something that you actually get involved with and start having a conversation about. And that can really get uh, an enthusiastic community together. It can get you more actively learning and better remembering things. And you can start having conversations that lead on to other topics as well. So you can get extra information out of a photograph that might show a dam or not. You can start then thinking about the wildlife, the weather, the hydrology, and so on. 
Sounds of Science is a, a talk that I gave about podcasting, and we actually have a version of this also available uh, in the links associated with this video in case you want to look at that in more detail. But my talk was thinking about podcasting and how podcasting is a really powerful tool now for outreach. And it's particularly powerful if you have audio recordings to go along with your voice. So if you're thinking about music or about the sounds of animals, for example, that can be really helpful. Or if you're telling stories and want to have a really compelling story told by a particular voice that can be quite humanizing and that can really draw in an audience. So podcasting is another great example of a way that you might get your research out there to the world. Drama is something that you often don't think about when you're thinking about how can you get a research project out into an audience because you often don't think Fiction is something that's really useful for presenting non-fictional facts. But actually, it's really great because people for thousands of years have connected with drama. Again, it has to do with that humanizing impact of a storyline, of a human voice providing information. And we can get really emotional when we see people acting out stories. We get pulled into that. We care about them. And so this is a really great way to share information and also to get people caring about particular issues. So in this case, resilience, Professor Katrina Brown is thinking about how do we educate people about climate change, about problems that are happening in the world, in their ecosystems, and getting them excited about going out to tackle those. So it's not just educating, but also um, getting some groundswell of grassroots activity. Another good example is Soapbox Science. So this is a sort of event that we also see increasingly often, where we're not just putting something on and expecting people to go out of their way to attend it, but events are being put into a public sphere in a really accessible place, just right in the middle of everything, so that as people are going about their daily lives, they can encounter these things and interact with them where they already are. So Soapbox Science started in London, but now you can find it all over the place. This is uh, akin to things we see like a pint of science where you've got events happening in pubs where people are having a pint but also hearing a talk about science. So again, it's taking the research, and it doesn't just have to be science research. Uh, these are just science examples. But you take that research into the world and just put it at people's fingertips so it's really easy for them to engage. So you're removing those barriers that might have been present, that might have prevented them from encountering these things to begin with. TED Talks are really popular as well. And again, one of the draws of TED Talks is that it does they remove barriers. So some people obviously do attend TED Talks live. There are audiences there that um, Brendan here is speaking to. But then this is recorded and it's put online. So no matter where the TED event happened, you can access that online and see that content. You didn't have to pay a fee to get in. You didn't have to drive somewhere. And this is a really educational tool because there are hundreds if not thousands of these talks now. And we see a lot of TED style events as well. So even if you can't link up to the TED program itself, you can do a similar sort of thing and then allow people to access those videos of those presentations. So I think what all of these slides show collectively is that there are many options of medium. You can choose from all different sorts of things. It might be writing or videos, there might be still images or audio, there could be performance, you might be creating artifacts and objects. You might just be having a bullet point list of methods or instructions that people can use in order to follow in your footsteps. But you also might have a combination of the above. And by combination, I partly mean that you might have a project that pulls in many of these things to create the finished version, or you might create something in one format but then also share it in others as well. So there are lots of ways to cover the bases and to do lots of different things really creatively so that you capture people who are interested in one particular medium especially and you don't exclude others as well. So there are ways to really um, cover the bases. When you are thinking about these different types of media and you're deciding which of these is appropriate, there are some things that you have to think about first. Who will your message be accessible to? So this kind of uh, is what I was alluding to when I was thinking about soapbox science, for example, where we're talking about barriers, uh, things being in the way of people engaging. But you also want to think beyond just 
will someone drive, will someone pay? You have to think, right, is someone blind? Are they deaf? If they are, can I do something so that they can still engage with this video or this audio sample? So make sure you're aware of any kind of barriers to interacting or um, to accessing your product so that you can mitigate that if possible. Think about who your message is going to be appealing to. If you create a video, there are certain people who never want to look at a video and so you're never going to get your message to them. For example, whenever I'm looking up instructions online, I want to see just a list that I can follow. I don't want to watch a film. But other people love to Google a film so that they can see how to carve a turkey or um, change a bike tire. So it really depends on the type of people that you want to interact with. And you're going to probably need to do a bit of research ahead of time to make sure you're targeting appropriately. You also want to think about what aspects of a topic you're able to emphasize with each different format. So for example, if you're thinking about sharing some insights about uh, birdsong research, it probably is not the sort of thing you want to just write about. What you might want to do is instead have a podcast so that you can play the bird song, or a video so that you can cut to a picture of the bird, perhaps a, a clip of the bird singing. So think about what, uh, what are you really trying to get across and what's the best way to do that. You also want to think about how much and what type of information to include. When you write something down, people can generally read much more quickly than if you're to say that and they're going to listen to you. So for example, if you're going to speak and you just want to have a couple of minutes uh, of a podcast or a, a few minutes of video, that's actually very little text. There's not a whole lot that you can cram in because we do speak more slowly than people read. And so if you do need to have a lot of information, you need to be thinking about whether you should just write a blog post, for example, or, you know, can you do it infographically instead? So that this will go along with some of these other ideas as well. But just be thinking about how much you can really fit into each product. And of course, we'll want to think about how easy all of this will be. Is it hard for you to create a video? Do you have a camera? Do you know how to edit? If you do have a camera, if you do know how to edit, no problem. But if you don't, then clearly that's probably not going to be the thing for you. Likewise, how can you distribute this? If you create a video and put it on YouTube, great. If you make DVDs, do people have DVD players? How are you going to send it to people? If you put them out uh, on display for people to take with them, are they actually going to do that? So just be thinking about these sorts of logistical details that go along with uh, actually creating a product. You need to make sure there's going to be some uptake and engagement with it as well. So I think there are also a few basics of um, the communications process itself, and I've already alluded to these a little bit. The first is what your message is going to be. And really, I think what this comes down to is what story are you going to tell? If you're a researcher, you start off with data. And the truth is that in terms of public interest, there's not generally a whole lot of interest in data. People don't want raw numbers or a series of facts or really detailed descriptions of very obscure things. What they want is for you to filter it, to visualize it, even if it's verbal visualization, but to, to create a picture for them that they can uh, use to imagine this information in a more accessible way. And ultimately what they want is for that to come across as a story. And again, this doesn't have to be fiction, it doesn't have to be a, a movie or a dramatic play, but story is just simply having something where you maybe ask a question, you provide some insights, and then you have a bit of a and this is the same sort of story format that we see in films. Uh, it's the same sort of thing that works whenever we are listening to any sort of narrative that pulls us in. There's a hook and there's something that builds to, to give you some explanation and to start moving you towards a finale. And then you understand at the end and perhaps even have an action so that you can then use that in your real life. So always be thinking about telling a story. You also need to consider your audience. You need to be thinking about how old are people? Are they young? If they're young, you can't use jargon. You can't use really um, elaborate words that people haven't encountered. You would have to simplify things. You might need to have fewer facts. It might need to be more active. Are they older? Are they people who are professionals? Are they amateurs? There are all sorts of characteristics about people that are going to influence 
how they engage with what you're presenting, whether you're talking about the information itself, or the content of it, or the format of it, or whatever other characteristic. Just empathize with your audience and, and see things from their perspective, and then tailor the message to them so you can ensure that they will actually see it, they'll engage with it, they'll enjoy it, they'll get something out of it, and they'll come back for more and, and be impacted by it. You also need to consider the environment in which people are going to be consuming whatever it is that you're producing. So if someone is going to be consuming something in their own home, that's one thing. You can expect a certain level, in most cases, of um, technological accessibility of things. Or you can think about, you know, if you've created a game, are people going to be playing a game at home? That makes sense. But what if you're in public, if you're on a street corner? You might not want to play a game on the street corner. That might be a bit complex. You might not want to play a video on a street corner. What could you do instead? Is someone going to be in a museum? Are they going to be with a chaperone or by themselves? Is it going to be in a theater? And if, it, if it's in a theater, or if it's in a large public venue like that, what are the acoustics going to be like? Are there going to be other things happening in the environment? Will the stage be too big for what you're trying to achieve? There are all sorts of questions that come along with every single different environment. And you need to think about packaging up your message so that it fits within the environment. And sometimes you find out about the environment first and have to create something to fit it. Sometimes you've created a thing and then you need to find an environment for it. It doesn't really matter what order you start in as long as you make sure that all these parts go together and work together and they aren't um, negatively impacting each other. Speaking of impact, it's really important to do something to gauge how well you are achieving your goals. So presumably you aren't just doing something because you have to do something and you don't care. You're putting time into this, you're probably putting money into this and effort. You care about it, I hope. And you don't want to do all of that in vain. And this is especially true if you think you're going to have to do it again. You want to learn so that you can do it better next time. Often we also find that you have to report on impact, especially if the research communication is being done because of a grant. And in the grant you've stated that you're going to do some outreach activities, and people then want to know, did you achieve anything with that? So you can think of a number of different ways to collect this information, but it's really useful to think of this ahead of time and build this into your activity if you can. So if you are um, out doing a public outreach event, for example, in a public square, you might have one of those little things like you have at airports or at a Paddington Station near the toilets where you can press a little button as you leave on an iPad and it just gives you a smiley face or a frowny face or a neutral and you can just say, yep, that was pretty good, that wasn't so great. And that gives you an overall sense of it, if it was okay. You might have surveys. So you might have people actually asking people questions actively. You might give participants a feedback survey where they can click a few buttons online or tick a few boxes in person. Uh, you might be sending out an email survey later on. So those are all kind of active sorts of things. It might be a bit more low key where you're just looking at faces. Are people smiling? Are people engaging? Are they asking you lots of questions? Um, did you get people congratulating you afterwards and saying, oh, I really got a lot out of that? Are you just looking at the number of people who have clicked on a link or the number of conversations that have resulted from something that you posted? It can look like a number of different things. What it looks like, how it's shaped, how it works, should be really specific to your project and your needs. But just make sure that you put some thought into this so you can collect those data and then use them to keep doing something better next time. And so you can also report useful numbers back to funding bodies or other um, other places that might need this information. There are also a few functional, logistical, practical sorts of considerations. Do you have the skills? I, I already mentioned, for example, do you have a camera? Do you know how to edit? So really basic things like that. Um, if not, you might need to get some training. Um, what sort of time do you have to devote? So maybe you don't have the time to write a blog post every week, but you might have the time to write a tweet. Or maybe you can't do a, a series of videos on YouTube and have a whole dedicated channel, but maybe you can do one film. So just think about what do you have that you can commit to this. It's important to consider intellectual property. So whether you are using someone else's things, um, if you've made a video and you use someone else's image, for example, or 
uh, if you are sharing your information, are you worried that you're not allowed to do that or that it might be problematic if someone shares that or perhaps you've signed a contract and you shouldn't be? So just think about that as well. You might want to generate revenue. You might not need to, you might not want to, that's fine. But it's always good to think about, do you want to try to, and if so, how much do you need? Do you want to create a self-sustaining product uh, and project? So perhaps just a few pence per view on YouTube can add up so that you could eventually buy a new camera and make better videos. Or maybe you're part of an organization where you have very limited funding and you can't keep devoting your time to making these films or making these podcasts, and so actually a little bit extra would help. And there are lots of different ways you can do this. Just think about whether that's something you do want to try to add in to your project in some way. I also think it's really helpful to consider how well material will age. You don't want to put hundreds of pounds and many, many hours into a video, for example, only to realize that as soon as a new study comes out, it's negated everything that you've said, so no one's going to want to watch that film again. So think about how you can talk about things, and which things you can talk about, and in what, which ways, in order to make something a bit more evergreen. So perhaps, if you're really interested in the cutting edge of stuff, what you could do is create some more expensive, more time-consuming resources that have foundational information that's unlikely to change. And then, wherever it is that you share that, you can have something that's a bit cheaper, a bit quicker, that just provides new updates on that. So you might have a little handout that goes along with the video, where the video is always going to be useful, but the handout is constantly refreshed. So something like that where you can make sure that the time and effort you're putting in are not being wasted. Finally, I also think it's important to think about whether there might be some drawbacks to exposure. People do have negative comments online. People do get abuse in public sometimes. Uh, you might find it tiring to talk to people. Uh, after a talk, so maybe you love to give presentations, but you're not much of a people person. If you give a presentation at a library, for example, someone will always come talk to you afterwards, and if you don't want to deal with that, then maybe public presentations aren't for you. Maybe you want an online video. So just think about pros and cons, and weigh those up, and consider, do I really want to proceed with this, or is there some alternative? I've done quite a lot of research communication, as you might expect, given that I'm the one giving this presentation. And there are a few bits of advice that I would give to people who are just starting off and thinking about engaging with this. I always think that it's great to look for ways to combine techniques. So can you uh, learn a particular skill and then use it in multiple ways? Can you create a certain thing and put it in different formats and use it in different places? Can you create something that's really multimedia so that it appeals to lots of people? So just trying to find ways where you can combine things in an interesting fashion that appeals to lots of folks and is as uh, engaging as possible. Going along with that is the reuse of material. So I've created this little visual here to show um, how I reused one particular bit of research that I did about um, avian communication. So I wrote an article about it, I gave a public, speak, I, <laughs> public speech, I had a podcast about it, I did a cafe scientifique, I had a YouTube video, I gave lectures here at Exeter, and I even had some images on Flickr where I created a little database of related photographs to support that content. So I have one bit of research that I use in a bunch of different ways to get to a lot of different audiences, and I use that one amount of effort that I put in ahead of time in a diverse uh, range of ways so that I could really get mileage out of that uh, research time that I had put in. I think that if you are worried about having the technical skills or spending the time to create the materials, you can always think about collaborators. And collaborators can help you share the burden a little bit so that you can do a video one week, someone else will do it for the next week, and someone else will do it for the third week, so you only have to do one or two a month that's much easier than doing one every week. So just think about who else can you work with that can help ease this process a little bit and make it easier. And alongside that, we'll be thinking about influencers. So if you have a really great product, but you're not really able to get it very far because you don't have the connections, see if you can collaborate with a few key people who can bounce that out to a wider audience and get it the attention that it deserves. 
One thing that can help if you are looking for a bit of a wider audience and you're not getting there yet, is to take advantage of things like holidays or other timely events, trends that are happening, um, hashtags that are emerging. So if people are talking about something, if they're alert to it, if they're in the mindset and they're doing some searching or they're interested in finding out more, then you should take advantage of that and see if you can piggyback a little bit and get your product out there. So for example, um, every Halloween, every Christmas, you see people who are, it's often even the same research as the last year, it's just being reused in some format, but you see people who hop on board. So for example, if someone who studies witches or warlocks or the occult, they might have a new interview or a new blog post every Halloween. Or for Christmas time, if you do something that's about cold weather or um, winter holidays, then you might, again, repackage a video or repackage uh, some writing that you've done in order to make it interesting again this year. So you can always look for things like that where people are just in the mood and so they'll consume what you produce. It's also really important to remember that the more you do this stuff, the better you get at it. The more you produce the same thing and then work on it and edit it and refine it, the better that thing will be. So take some time. Don't worry if you do a thing and later on think it's silly. You'll have learned something from that and then you can use that to apply to the next project that you undertake. Try as many of these as possible and see what fits you, see what fits your research, see what fits your audience. And then you can start to refine once you've decided this is really my medium, this is what I like. You can start to refine your skills and get much better at that. And you can start to refine the product to make sure that it's as good as it can be as well. With all of these things, it is a bit of work, but it's also fun. And hopefully you'll find a balance between fun and work. And as you produce more of those things, you'll find that the rewards you get, the interactions, uh, the, the learning of people, the connections that you make, all of that will make it worthwhile.